Welcome back to the e-Shikshana program of VTU. Uh, we are continuing with uh, the water supply and sanitation, which is uh, a part of building services, 18 ARC 43. Uh, in the previous class, I had taught to you about introduction to environment and health aspects. So today we are going to look at water supply. And in water supply, we are going to basically understand the second part of module one here, which is water supply and its whole components, conveyance, as well as, uh, you know, the apparatuses. So here with, we are beginning. Water by definition is actually a compound which is formed out of one hydrogen molecule and two oxygen molecules, H2O. You all know it. It's combined by a covalent bond. The water is found in all living things and is one of the most available substances on earth. If you actually understand the pH scale, this, this is the uh, acidic scale and that is the basic scale and neutral. So water falls under the neutral scale and we have to understand the role of water in terms of uh, its significance with respect to uh, how it has uh, been playing an important role in terms of our life. So we need to respect water, we need to not uh, have any kind of uh, imparity with respect to wastage, pollution as well as how exactly can we work with respect to the government by paying the, for its services have some kind of uh, a belonging by bringing in an action and conserve water by conserving our environment. So we are going to basically try to see the phases of water here. Water has three different phases. Common basic things that I am going to talk about is it is available as gas when it condenses, it is available as solid when it sublimes and in liquid when it freezes and vaporizes. So, the three different phases of water and that is the only liquid, uh, that is the only form uh, that we can see in all the three phases of water. <coughs> so, this is one of the mind map that we worked on with our students where uh, we actually gave in one word water and lot of other words came up with respect to its connection to water. So, many people basically brought in uh, relevant objectives like uh, how it is uh, one of the transportation system to us, how it was used in terms of process of paper making and the cleaning factories, uh, how exactly it is used in almost all the industrial, you know, uh, processes, the workers use it with respect to their processes and then agriculture uses it, residences uses it. And everywhere if we actually try to understand water, water is one of the most essential component that is going to you know, play an important role in terms of our survival. So what are the sources of water? Water sources are with respect, as we all know right from our basics, that almost 97 percent of our water that is available on earth is found in our oceans. The rest. 3 percent is found as fresh water and uh, this fresh water basically comes from uh, the rain water which uh, gets frozen and then it flows down into lakes, rivers and streams in 1 person and uh, when it is per percolated into our ground water that comes out around 22 percent of our water. So this is the whole percentage of water which we either consume is basically within this. 3 percent and what is unconsumable is almost 197 percent. So, uh, this is the ground water basically convenient for all the living creatures to live in. We also use the underground water th through bore wells and wells and the streams and rivers which bring in water. <laughs> If you actually consider it the um, kind of sources that we have, we have lakes and ponds, we also have streams and rivers, storage reservoirs and oceans which are called as the surface sources and then we also have subsurface or underground surfaces wherein infiltration galleries, infiltration wells, springs, 
wells and tube wells are the fourth category in terms of underground sources. So, these are the different sources of water. Almost all of these are natural, inclusive of the subsurface also, but this is seen over the ground, this is seen and known to us and this is basically relieved out of pressure and brought in for our own consumption. So, if you actually look at how exactly the whole water cycle is, we first have rain water which flows down the clouds, then falls into the reservoirs, has a runoff, works into the streams and rivers, evaporates, you know, so has the ev uh, evapotranspiration there and then with respect to it, that comes in with the water treatment plan which is where the municipal authorities come in and then they bring in the industrial usage from there, treat the water and inject it through the walls and have some kind of a shallow monitoring wells and deep monitoring wells which bring in all the subsurface water. We recharge all the water in a recharge basin, use it either for our residences or for our agricultural purposes, again through diversion canals. And then that goes into our aquifers which are either unconfined or confined or with respect to our agricultural supplies. So, this is the whole groundwater table calculative usage of water and how we monitor and use the water right from its source to its host end. The first source rain water as we all know is the source of water that comes from above the clouds. This water is very pure, it is good source of water supply both for individual families as well as communities. Rainwater also has a phenomenon called precipitation. So, this is a phenomenon where the water drops which are formed in the clouds in the atmosphere fall onto the ground. So, and this has various forms. We call rain when the water falls down in the form of liquid. We call it snow when it falls down in the form of solid and we also call it hail when it <coughs> comes down as cubes or in solid matter. So, totally depending on how we see the water falling upon us through the atmosphere that is a phenomenon known as precipitation. Rainwater as you all know is liquid precipitation as opposed to non-liquid kinds such as snow, hail and sleet. It basically begins with vaporization of water near the earth's surface in the form of rivers, lakes, oceans or ground water provided there are atmospheric temperatures above the melting point of water which is 0 degree Celsius. This is followed by the condensation of atmospheric water vapor into drops of water that are heavy enough to fall, often making it to the surface. So, the rain water which basically falls upon the surface condenses into the atmospheric water vapor and then you know it converts itself into drops of water and then saves itself for our temperature with respect to the melting point of water. Then the next source is groundwater. Groundwater makes up about 20 percent of the world's fresh water supply which is almost about 0.61 percent of the entire world's water including the oceans as well as the permanent ice. What basically is groundwater? Groundwater makes up around 22 percent of the water we use. It is the water which is beneath the earth surface which, which fills up all the cracks and other openings in the beds of rocks and sand. It exists in all the layers of soils and sands and it is able to retain the water. This retaining of water is called as water table. The water table is the line between unsaturated soil and saturated soil. Below the water table is where the rocks and soils are full of water. So, you see this is the soil, this is loam which is soft clay, then we have sand and gravel and then that is water which is saturated <clears throat> and then we have another layer of loam, clay and then impermeable ro rock. So, what we basically consume is from this first 
initial layer comes in through our bore wells and wells. Then whatever we dig deep below because we do not have enough water in this particular region it comes down from the saturated soil. So, now if you actually look at the whole water and its uh, level of uh, aquifers, we have uh, something called as a recharge area. A recharge area is where the water basically gets consumed by the ground and the ground table increases in its water content. Then we have the discharge area that is from where the rivers and the streams that the water comes out. So, it takes certain number of days for the water to stay there, certain number of years, <coughs> centuries and millenniums and that is the flow of direction. From the recharge area, we see that there is a restricted flow when it comes to years and it when it comes to ages, but then when it flows down the days, that is how it discharges into our residential consumption and then either it is res, uh, put in through the treatment plants and comes down directly into our residences or it comes through pumps. So, in the pumps we basically are consuming the upper layer of the water which is basically uh, on the confined bed you know right above the confined bed below the land surface. So, this actually collects all the water which has been collected very recently and not which is collected centuries and millennials. So, that is the low path of recharge right from its charge area that is the recharge area into the discharge area. Surface water this includes all the streams, rivers, lakes, reservoirs as well as wetlands. So, whatever we see all upon our surfaces are co considered as surface water. This is one of the water supply which is regularly replenished by various weather events. So, a lot of weather events keep happening, the changes in weather, the changes in seasons actually affect this particular water uh, source. The water taken from these bodies of water is rarely consumed without prior treatment. So, you cannot consume this water without any kind of treatment because the treatment includes pumping all this water through water treatment plants. Then it is filtered, it is purified with the help of special chemicals and then this purified water basically travels through all the water pipes all across the city, country or the area and then follows down onto our residential pipelines. Then there is also another term which is basically you know uh, considered as an alternative option for uh, ground water that is desalination because if you actually understand that we have around 97 percent of our water which is found in the oceans. So, the world's oceans contain at least over 97.2 percent of the planet's water resources. So, when we are going to tap this particular resource, it allows us to go with the great potential and provide us a sustainable drought proof water supply. Now, this provides this desalination is basically providing 1 percent of the world's drinking water, but this percentage is growing on as in uh, every year. The high salinity of the ocean water and the significant cost associated with this process means most of the world's water supply has traditionally come from fresh water because we cannot actually afford the amount of processes that this particular desalination process has to go through. Otherwise, we are do basically dependent on groundwater aquifers, rivers and lakes. Now, what is desalination? Many countries with limited access to other forms of water supply heavily rely on this source. That said, this water source is not cheap. Desalination actually requires a plant with a lot of electricity to process as it needs extensive treatment before it becomes fit for consumption. Thus, while it is one of the major sources of water, it is the most expensive one. So, what basically happens here is if you actually understand reverse osmosis, we have pressure, we have pure water and both of them 
flow in with respect to a semi permeable membrane. So, there is salt water which is the ocean water and then we also have a fresh water. So, both of them combine together with respect to one direction of water flow through a semi permeable membrane and then bring forward pure water to us with the kind of pressure that we are going to provide. Now, we are going to actually look into one video which has been uh, uh, taken forward from Seven Waters uh, official website and when Seven, Wat Seven Waters is a water treatment plant which is basically located in the US. They collaborated with uh, Darwin's studio to actually work on an animation to make a layman understand what is desalination and this uh, video has been sourced from YouTube. I thank YouTube for actually giving us such sources. Now, let's look into the video. As the Earth's population continues to grow and develop, our limited freshwater resources become increasingly scarce. We are fortunate that the Earth's oceans offer an alternative and can provide a sustainable supply of potable water. Seawater can be economically and reliably converted to potable water through a process known as seawater reverse osmosis. The process starts by extracting water from the ocean using wells located on the shoreline or by using an intake structure located in the open ocean. Osmosis is a naturally occurring process where a solvent, such as water, passes through a semi-permeable barrier. The semi-permeable barrier, or membrane, allows some things to pass through it but not others. In nature, the direction of flow through the membrane is from a less concentrated solution, such as fresh water, to a more concentrated solution, such as seawater, until equilibrium is reached. Reverse osmosis is when the opposite occurs. By pressurizing the concentrated solution, the seawater, we are able to force water molecules to pass from the salty seawater solution through the membrane to the fresh water. To protect the reverse osmosis membranes from becoming clogged by solid particles that can be suspended in the seawater, the seawater is filtered before passing through the membranes. This is accomplished by using multimedia filters, which are tanks or vessels containing a series of layered granular materials. These materials can be anthracite, garnet, sand, pebbles, and or gravel, which are assembled in layers. The filters remove sand, twigs, seaweed, and other particles from the seawater. In some cases, other types of membranes, known as ultrafiltration and microfiltration membranes, are used instead of multimedia filters to pretreat the seawater. Next, the filtered seawater travels to the cartridge filters, which act as a second stage of filtration. Cartridge filters used for seawater reverse osmosis are typically made from a yarn-like synthetic material that is wound into cartridges. These remove even smaller solid particles from the seawater, such as fine sand and clay, before the seawater proceeds to the reverse osmosis membranes. High pressure pumps increase the pressure of the seawater up to 1,000 psi. The pressure needs to be sufficiently high to overcome the naturally occurring osmotic pressure and force water from the saltwater side through the reverse osmosis membranes to the freshwater side. The salt particles in the seawater are rejected from passing through the membrane to the freshwater side and remain behind on the concentrated saltwater side. The reverse osmosis membrane can be thought of as a number of sealed envelopes connected at their open ends to a tube. There are spacers between each envelope which allow water to flow across the membranes. The membrane, envelopes, and spacers are then wound around the tube like a roll of paper towels. The reverse osmosis membranes are then enclosed in a fiberglass shell. The membranes are connected end to end, usually six to seven membranes together, and housed in vessels that are built to withstand pressures up to 1200 psi. As the pressurized seawater enters the pressure vessel and flows across the membrane surface, the water molecules are forced into and through the membrane envelopes, leaving the salt molecules behind. The desalted water passes through the membrane and emerges at low pressure where it is collected in a tube and directed to one end of the pressure vessel. The concentrated salt stream that is rejected from flowing through the membrane continues to pass across the membrane surface where it is collected separately. 
The concentrated salt stream retains about 55% of the total energy of the seawater stream that was originally fed to the membranes. To reduce the energy that is required to operate the reverse osmosis plant, the pressurized concentrated stream is piped into an energy recovery device. Here, up to 98% of the energy of the concentrated salt stream is transferred to an equal volume of the incoming seawater in an isobaric energy recovery device. The energy recovery device significantly reduces the plant's operating costs by recovering the concentrated salt stream energy and using it to pressurize 60% of the seawater that is fed to the membranes. The concentrated salt stream will have about a 60% higher salinity than the incoming seawater. The concentrated salt stream is sent back to the ocean through a brine disposal well, or a device known as a brine outfall. The brine outfall is situated in an area of significant ocean flow so that the salt levels are quickly returned to equilibrium with the ocean. The location for the outfall should contain no sensitive marine ecosystems. In a properly designed brine outfall, no noticeable increase in salinity can be detected at a distance of a few meters from the discharge. The pressurized seawater leaving the energy recovery device has its pressure boosted by a small booster pump so that it is at the same pressure as the seawater leaving the high pressure pump. The boost is necessary as some pressure has been lost as the stream travels through the reverse osmosis system. Approximately 40% of the seawater that enters the system is converted to potable water during the reverse osmosis process. The potable water is further treated by adding calcium carbonate to improve the taste and bring the pH to the neutral range. Chlorine is also injected to provide disinfection properties as the water travels from the reverse osmosis plant through the distribution pipes to homes and businesses. When proper conservation of natural water resources is practiced, water reuse has been applied and a water deficit still remains. Seawater reverse osmosis can offer a sustainable alternative. With good stewardship, it can provide life-sustaining water for coastal communities. Desalted water supplies, which are not susceptible to drought and other natural disasters, can provide a clean, safe potable water supply. With this, we've actually understood the reverse osmosis process as well as desalination as to what exactly is the process and what goes through the whole you know, connection, right, from connecting the water body, uh, uh, the connection from oceans and then bringing the water back to our consumption levels. As we all know, desalination is a viable alternative energy option. With this uh, kind of uh, an alternative option, we also have chances of utilizing more uh, you know, of ocean or salted water, but then it's, since it is very expensive, not many people actually use this kind of a water source. Other than that, we also have the next source that is lakes and ponds. They are inland bodies which are standing either in slow moving water or they are um, just there with uh, slow water. This covers almost like 2 percent of the wo world's land surface and contains most of the world's fresh water here. Individual lakes and ponds which are ranging in areas from 5 square meters, few square meters to thousands of square kilometers. Lakes and ponds allow all the sunlight to reach the bottom which makes all the plants to grow there. Algae floating at the surface is one of the major producer of uh, uh, algae and herons have long legs which allow them to wade in the shallow ponds. So many animals are adapted for life in such water and this is one good source which actually has a lot of relationship with every living being there. And this totally depends on the size of depression of the surface there. And it is not a major source of water supply, but it has plenty of algae, weed and other vegetable growth which imparts bad smell, taste as well as color to the water. The next source are rivers and streams. Very few plants and algae can grow here because the water is fast moving. First level consumers basically rely on leaves and seeds that fall onto the streams. Plants take root among the pebbles at the river bottom. Here insects need to have hooks or sucks that help them cling to rocks. 
and trout have streamlined bodies that allow them to swim. So, this is how the whole ecosystem is around the rivers and streams, but if you actually understand the spaces there, land uh, small stream channels actually feed the waters. Uh, to the lakes or rivers and then we, they, we also have most of the rivers in India are perennial and certain are non-perennial. If you actually go back to what we have seen in terms of the different sources of water, we have surface sources like ray, rivers, lakes, ponds and reservoirs and then we also have underground sources like springs, wells and infiltration galleries. In terms of wells, we have artesian wells, we also have dug wells or draw wells and then we also have tube wells. When it comes to drug wells, we have two different types of dug wells which are shallow wells and deep wells. Shallow wells are wells which are actually not very deep and they are actually found at the first or second layer of the land. The deep wells basically are like the deep, um, bore wells and which are much uh, shorter than the tube wells. Next, uh, uh, we basically would be looking at what exactly are the resources that are available in India. If you look at the annual precipitation inclusive of the snowfall, we have at least around 4000 billion cubic meters, uh, cubic meters of water which is available in India of which 1869 BCM which is almost like our annual potential in terms of our perennial rivers which again disintegrates itself into 1123 BCM which is an estimated utilizable water wherein it is divided into 690 BCM for surface water and 433 for ground water. So, this is the only utilizable water percentage that we find at our country. Uh, if you actually look at uh, what exactly is the usable water math here, according to our resources we almost have 4000 cubic billion cubic meters of water that is available with it of which 1047 is lost in evaporation, 1084 is non-available water and what is available is 1869 as already mentioned of which usable water is only 1123 for which we got around uh, 395 for ground water and 728 BCM for surface water. So, these are certain uh, you know statistical uh, measurements uh, and dimensions that we get of the available water resources in India which basically talks about what exactly can we do in terms of what is available to us and how can we actually get further in terms of putting them forward in you know better usage of our facilities because uh, as we all know our usage of facilities are basically for uh, washing of our hands, the toiletries, uh, cleaning of uh, spaces, cooking, washing of spaces and washing of utensils, drinking water, gardening and washing vehicles basically uses almost all of our usable water of which uh, if you look at our daily water usage in terms of one person at least for one day he almost he or she almost uses 120 gallons of water ok. So, in which if you see uh, the consumption of fresh water with respect to our whole percentage is 70 percent of our usable water basically is going off to agriculture, 20 percent for industries and 10 percent only comes towards as uh, you know uh, for uh, drinking purposes. So, that is for domestic purposes. So, we have this kind of a share which basically our government of India talks about in terms of consumption of usable water while household only gets 5 percent of it. Of the 5 percent we are at least using only uh, you know 65 gallons per day for our outdoor activities and for indoor activities we are almost using like 55 gallons only. So, if you look at the water demand per capita water usage of our country, right after 2006 we see a decline 
in the population in terms of the population demand in terms of water usage which is efficient water usage is declining because um, they say according to the statistical figures the future potential of water uh, is going to be very low in terms of uh, you know uh, comparative studies with uh, the other countries which also have some equal amount of proportion in terms of population. So, if we basically see that water is very essential for our life and for many people the quantity of water is available in terms of minimality, but the minimal water that is available today is not of very good quality and some of the issues that we need to consider when we are trying to work on terms of our planning requirements in providing the right kind of source of water supply, we have to see that these are certain things that we have to consider in terms of appropriate sources of water for rainwater. For collection of rainwater from any existing roof structure or a ground catchment area, provide a useful supplementary source of water even if it is not used as a main supply. So, please keep in mind or bear in mind that a main supply of water is needed and for which storage tanks are usually required because they make the best use of rain water. For surface water when the rain falls to the ground it becomes surface water as you all know and surface water is easily polluted and can be affected by wide seasonal variations which are happening in our country and in terms of turbidity with respect to the muddiness that comes in contact with the rain water and flow. So, variations in this turbidity present a challenge for the effective operation of treatment processes while variations in flow affect the location and design of abstraction structures. So, surface water is the easiest to access as you can see in the image because what you have to do is you just have to collect all the surface water into one storage uh, space and from there probably to different types of pumps. It could be a rover pump or a coil pump or even through a well, a rope washer pump and suction pump, you can actually see as to based on how exactly uh, or how effectively this water is going to be used for our usage can be utilized. And there are various ways as I mentioned, open well is one way in which we can actually use this for, sur for surface water. Here ground water is at least available at uh, the low depth because less than 15 meters and the water is available all the year round that is where open wells are used. Wherever safe water ground is available up to 60 meters of depth, a hand pump is ideal choice for any kind of a cluster or habitation where you know at least uh, water which is available at 60 meters of depth. A borewell or tube well is used where ground water is at a greater depth and open wells or hand pumps are not viable and bore wells are installed at those places where you know it is very difficult for you to find surface water at a closer proximity. So, this is one way of storing our uh, store uh, surface water like when the surface water hits upon our roof, we collect all the roof uh, water and then connect them all to one chamber of storage and from there it enters into our rain water storage system which is utilized uh, all year round when the scarcity of water is actually uh, found. For ground water, some of the surface water basically sinks into the ground and becomes ground water. Here it remains for a very long time in terms of an aquifer. Aquifer are spaces where uh, you know which are underground and water you know starts collecting there or getting holded there because the surrounding earth and rock is impervious that is it does not let the water through. So, ground water is obtained from these kind of uh, uh, surfaces through these ways through three different ways one is from mountain springs, second is through shallow wells and third is through shallow or deep bore hills. So, this is one shallow well. It is a shallow well where we are basically trying to concentrate on collecting all the water which has been you know um, not able to pass through this kind of a surface. So, it is available only at this particular surface and when you pump it out or when you 
um, draw out the water, it is easier for us to use this particular type of water. Other than that, water is also needed to supply an irrigation scheme which is taken from any kind of a water source. The most common source of water for irrigation basically includes rivers, reservoirs and lakes and also the ground water. So, what happens is uh, this is the river body right. So, first thing we do is we kind of uh, divert the river through a different dimension. So, if we have an irrigational field ok. Once it diverts then we try to put up a wall and try to see if we can bring in enough amount of water which is required for our irrigational purposes. Or we can also try to see if we can pump all the water from the river directly and then put up a you know uh, uh, windmill or something which basically keeps working on the pumping of the water in terms of the demand or availability. Or we can even try to see if a reservoir can be constructed and then we can collect all the water there and use it as an according to our needs. So, selecting a water source for a community a water supply system basically requires a lot of consideration based on the range of factors. One is socio political and cultural considerations. When I mean socio cultural as well as political considerations, it is basically because we are talking about development here, development in terms of technical requirements. So, if the water supply is not culturally appropriate and causes a lot of security difficulties or restricts the people uh, like women or disabled people, the benefits of this kind of a new system will be limited. So, we have to be very sure in terms of how people are coming across to actually access this water. So, socio political as well as cultural considerations are to be given a lot of concern. Other than that as I mentioned earlier women and water. It is often that you see in most of the rural areas or even in the urban areas you see that the women and children are almost involved in water collection and its usage. They are likely to have the most knowledge about existing sources around and they are the people who are likely to benefit if new supplies are provided to by a city. And they are the most likely to suffer if the new water supply system is not appropriate. So, we have to always keep in mind the needs of this particular community because participatory approaches while selecting the water sources as well as designing the village level supply system is a prerequisite in consideration with the requirements of women as well as children. If some sections of the community are not involved and the views are not taken into account. Uh, count the water supply system is said to be underused mostly and may easily fall into disrepair. So, you have to and people might get back to the old water sources which are more or less polluted. So, you have to keep in mind about this particular consideration also. The third is water community communities. Water communities are set up in many areas to manage water supply systems. Care must also be taken to ensure that all groups in the community are represented and can make their concerns and needs heard and understood. It is often very difficult to achieve this. So, women for example may form part of the water community also and also uh, may have a voice within it because of the cultural or social conditions which might prevent them from speaking in public. So, you have to always keep in mind that any water committee would have a couple of women from the uh, same community who are going to access the water. So, they could voice out the opinions as well as you, you know the, those voices can be uh, taken care of while actually designing the whole new water supply system. An operation and maintenance care should also be taken while identifying any personnel who are going to undertake the training because uh, they are going to be responsible for connecting, operating as well as maintaining the whole uh, schedule of systems in terms of water sources for the new town or the new place. You have to also keep in mind about yield versus the demand. Yield should always be adequate. If a more convenient supply is developed then consideration should be given to the potential increase in demand 
and to the possible migration of outsiders into the community, particularly wherever there is very less water available. So, what this means is, so wherever you have good irrigational facility, wherever you have good agricultural concerns, you have to always keep in mind about the convenient supply system. Then you have to also think about what exactly happens if the you know the potentiality of this particular land increases then the demand for water also increases for which many people from outside might start entering into our villages and because of which the water should not be scarce at that moment. So, you have to have enough water when the demand increases. The quality of water is also needed because all water is susceptible to contamination. It might accumulate a lot of contaminants from the air from the ground or from rocks. These contaminants such as low levels of certain minerals or compounds are basically not very harmful for us for in terms of health, but there might be a lot of presence of pathogens here. So, pathogens as I mentioned earlier in the previous classes also basically lead you to diseases. So, you have to be very sure of what kind of quality of water is acceptable here and what are the treatment methods that are suitable if our community is concerned in terms of providing the new water source. The technical requirements are for uh, developing of a uh, water source you have to always think technically because how feasible is this particular project and the operation and maintenance requirements for the source should be abstracted and the supply system should also be appropriate in terms of the availability of resources. While uh, economic considerations you have to also keep in mind about the construction costs as well as the operation and maintenance of the system because you are not thinking about today and tomorrow, but you have to thinking about the future maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years, maybe another 50, 60 years where the construction also is becomes feasible as well as the operation and maintenance of the whole system of supply for the source becomes very convenient. Legal as well as management requirements, your current ownership of the land as well as the legal requirements of obtaining permission to the abstract are also factors to consider while selecting a source. Sources on private land may cause access problems for certain groups which may not be apparent at the outset. The consequences of any sitting decisions should be considered very carefully because uh, you know when a uh, water source is provided, when a new water supply system is being given you have to think about a lot of legal requirements which are being coming in. So, the kind of water works, the kind of paperwork that comes with respect to permissions also should also be thought of because any private land may you know and the water belonging to that private developer or development board might have a lot of issues in terms of providing water to the rest of the groups. So, you have to be very curious while looking into the whole um, you know flow of water right from the source and consider it very carefully in terms of the outset. Impacts of the development. The use of one particular source of water should, will have a lot of impacts on people who are going to use it on the animals as well as on the environment. The impacts of the people might be positive, might be negative and might also be related to other uh, considerations like health, economic status as well as time. If a surface water source is used there might be impacts on remote users. And likewise, if the waste water enters the surface water, there might be similar impacts. So, you have to be very considerate in terms of what is going to happen if there is further development uh, around your source of water. So, impacts on the environment might include loss of vegetation, erosion as well as drainage of an aquifer. So, if you actually look at the worsening water scenario in terms of any developmental patterns, you see India's water supply is expected to meet only half its demand according to many studies which have been done by the uh, UNICEF report uh, which submitted its report in 2013. It which said by 2030 we might only have around uh, you know 71 percent of the water resources which are available in their 36 percent of the land and only of which 56.5 percent is going to be utilizable. So, we are going to almost you know 
be very dependent on scarcity of water and so we have to always think about alternative sources in terms of bringing together a proper available water resource. If you also look at how we are uh, having a, you know the kind of water footprint, we know our sources, the sources could be rain water and which could be des desalinated water that is the ocean water and that would have its direct impact on surface sources and ground sources which are going to be utilized in industries, households that is residential purposes, agricultural for recreational purposes and for environmental aspects. So, you know of all these uh, you know needs and requirements that we see water is a very precious resource, but if we look at its uh, uh, water pr uh, footprint we see that uh, there is a footprint which is different in terms of a developing country and there is a footprint in terms of an un uh, developed country. A developed country uses uh, water 6 times. Uh, more than a developing country and by another 25 percent increase might happen by 2030 if you actually look at the person's each person's requirement per day. So, what do we have to do? We have to always keep in mind that uh, conservation of water is one of the basic priority for us in terms of consideration in terms of sources of water. Because if there is a fact that is to be considered there is nearly the same amount of water on earth as there was around a million years ago. That means, we are not low in terms of water availability, we are not uh, low in terms of scarcity of water, we are basically low in terms of utilization of water. So, how much can be utilized of all the amount that is prevalent. So, combining all of it, what we see here is again the sources of water which uh, is going to be classified as uh, one is the precipitated water which could be surface surfaces like lakes natural, streams and rivers which are basically the perennial uh, rivers and streams and how we are going to impound them and store them in our reservoirs and ocean generally is not used for water supplies at present, but this is also one of the surface source of water for us. Other than this, we also have subsurface sources such as springs, the infiltration galleries and the infiltration wells. So, infiltration galleries are the galleries where water is kept for a longer period of uh, time and wells would have it for shorter habitat uh, spaces. Wells and tube wells are basically where uh, the uh, ground water is at a very low depth and uh, for a habitable space we have to always keep in mind about uh, the smaller the habitable space the smaller the bore wells and tube wells at the distance that it is available. So, this is how we are uh, you know broadly classifying the sources of water supply and with this we end this session. Thank you so much.